Uh, so many challenges we experience as well in the world today, um, things that we go through personally. And uh, I, was, I was thinking about a lot of stuff over the last month as Lewis was teaching us and Peter and the suffering that the early church went through, and the challenges they had to go through as Christians in an empire that was unchristian. And sometimes I think we think that the days we live in are worse than the days that the early church lived in, but I wouldn't trade what we have right now for what they had to go through. And uh, so there's, there's too much of an emphasis, I think, nowadays on the rapture. And, and what I mean by that is the escapist mentality. I hear this from Christians all the time. I hope Jesus comes tomorrow so we can get out of here. And it's, it's so self-serving, right? I mean, do you realize, and I'm going to give you some statistics here this morning. The 1040 window, is anybody familiar with that? 1040 window, okay. Uh, there's 5.3 billion people there that haven't heard the gospel yet. That doesn't count the people in your sphere of influence that hasn't heard of the Lord yet, that, know, that need to know Jesus, family members, coworkers, neighbors. Um, do you think it's like really a good idea to think about getting out of here until we get the job done? Jesus, the last thing he said was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And when Jesus was ascending, right before his ascension, in the book of the Acts, the disciples were saying, well, are you going to restore your kingdom now? In other words, they were anticipating the kingdom of God to begin. And Jesus said, that's uh, not for you to know. Uh, only my father knows that who's in heaven. And so he's ascending and they're freaking out thinking like, where's he going? And the angel's saying, hey, the same Jesus you see who's being taken up from you shall return and come back again in like manner. This is you've seen him depart. So... The rapture is an exciting teaching, and when we're in the books of the Bible that discuss that, we cover that, eschatology, doctrine of end times. Uh, but I think as Christians, we're to be prepared that the Lord could come tomorrow, right? But plan as though he may not be coming for a long time. And when you plan, you, you make plans. Young people make plans. They want to get married. They want to get educated. They want to get a house. They want to have a family. They want to raise kids. They're not thinking about getting out of here. They're enjoying life. They're enjoying every day that the Lord gives them, experiencing uh, the blessings of living in life. And uh, there's so much negativity in our world now where Christians are losing their joy uh, of, of experiencing the abundant life that Christ has come to give us. He says, I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Uh, Jesus didn't tell the guys, hey, don't worry, the rapture's happening tomorrow or next year and you, know, you won't have any more problems. He just tells us he's going to come again. So no one knows when he's coming again. We need to be prepared. But the over-focus, I think, in these days in the American church and evangelical churches in particular is all about getting out of here and the job isn't even close to being done yet, okay? So at Calvary Chapel here in Westmoreland County, we have a vision of preparation to continue on until he comes back. And so there's several things happening. The radio station. If I thought the Lord, if we thought the Lord was coming tomorrow, why would we work on a radio station? <laughs> and why would we spend the money and put an antenna up and all this stuff? We believe that this is what he's prepared and called us to do and he's provided. So I got good news. The FCC gave us permission to start building the station. Amen. Praise the Lord. So you, got, you guys can be praying. We need a surveyor. We need an engineer. We need the rigging team and Bob Stevens, who's our partner in the station, to be on site at the same day with good weather to put the antenna up. So the azimuth, the mathematical algorithms of how the antenna was designed, is set up exactly the way we were given permission from the FCC. And it's got to be taken up 450 feet high. So pray about that. That's a wow. pretty high, right? Uh, they use rigging devices to get it up there safely. So 
Uh, we're hoping, God willing, we could be on the air by the end of May. We'll see what happens. But it's, it's a reality now. And we want to thank you for your offerings and your giving that has uh, enabled us to be able to uh, tackle such a big project. And uh, so I, I get an email this morning, and we're a mission church as well, a uh, mission-minded church. Let me find the email here. And um, so Mike Dawson, who is a missionary with Kayla and Gary and Marie and the Yanomano uh, Indians in the jungles of Venezuela, uh, they, have, um, they have been preparing to go back into the jungle with a thousand torches. We showed the video, the Zoom uh, video of the torch, which enables them to take these devices into the uttermost regions of the jungle, and the natives can hear the gospel in their own language. It's remarkable with this solar-powered uh, device. And uh, they're expensive. They're about 70 bucks uh, loaded up and landed in, in the jungle, so it, it, it requires, uh, you know, resources to provide that for these natives. Now, the Dawsons have been um, in that area since they were babies. Their parents went there in the 50s, and now they're our age, is my age, and they're, they're doing the missions there. And um, it's a challenging place because it's, there's, there's no infrastructure. It's all jungle and rivers and snakes and alligators and piranhas and all kind of poisonous stuff that can get a hold of you if you're not careful. And to go into the depths of the jungles requires a lot of effort going up by riverboat, um, taking trees that have been down and using chainsaws to make a way to get through the rivers to get these devices into the hands of the people. Well, the Dawsons have been there their whole life, and they sort of thought that they had pretty much accomplished the purpose of why God sent them to get the gospel out to all the natives in the jungles of, of Venezuela. And because of Google Maps now, you can begin to see things you couldn't see years ago, right? So you, Mike's messing around his computer, and he's looking, and he's seeing these clearances, meaning that there's people, natives, living in certain places in the jungle, all over the jungles that they didn't even know existed. And so now they have this burden to take the gospel into these places that have never heard yet about Jesus. Now, I never hear Mike talk about the rapture ever. <laughs> He's praying like, Lord, give me time to get the gospel of Jesus to these poor people that need him. That's the heart of a missionary. That's the heart of the Lord. Jesus is not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. So there's so much work to get done, isn't there? Does anybody in here have friends and loved ones that they want to see get saved? Raise your hands. Every one of you. So do you want Jesus to come tomorrow so they're left behind? Pray that it, it's some time. Give us some time, Lord, to get the job done. So Mike says, dear praying friends, this is a short note to bring you up to date on all that has happened since our last update. We spent a few days trying to get a flight from the capital city straight to the jungle, but our contact there told us that at the present time, that would not be possible. So we contacted a shipping company and had our stuff shipped to Puerto Ayacucho. Our stuff was picked up on Friday and delivered to a friend with a warehouse on Saturday morning at 8 a.m. We flew into Ayacucho at 10 and were pleasantly surprised that not a single box had even been opened. We had loaded these crates in Macon, Georgia with a lift on a rider truck, and then in Caracas, we watched as they loaded the crates still wrapped in the original plastic from Macon using a forklift. But we assumed they would have to unload each crate from the truck to the warehouse, but there were our crates still in the original plastic wrap in our friend's warehouse. They're blown away. He explained they used long planks inside the crates from the truck down. The crates were pushed into place. All this to say, amazing as it sounds, our stuff looks as good as it did when it was shipped from Macon, Georgia, sitting now in a small warehouse on the edge of the jungle. Praise the Lord. Last night, we met with a friend who's going to try to get us permits to fly us and as much of the stuff as we can afford to fly up with us. He thinks we can have a permit by Wednesday, and if it goes well, a man from Quest Kodiak Airplane has agreed to fly us up next Monday Folks, this is a huge matter for prayer. Things are very difficult at this time to get into the jungle, but as God has demonstrated to us over and over, he is a way maker. Yes. 
Then whatever we can't afford to fly in, we will have come up by boat. It goes without saying that we will fly in with all the torches. There's a thousand of them. There's four projectors and backpacks. The projectors show the Jesus film in the middle of the jungles in the language of the people. And countless hundreds get saved by seeing this. Uh, these are fragile, so pray for wisdom as we go through the shipment. And it goes up by air. And what goes up by boat goes out with saying, we have everything packed, has a place and a purpose for the ministry. Thanks so much for your prayers. We will try to keep you all up to date on going what's going on. And so he, he sends this and we pray, get it out in the prayer Zoom. And so I, I email him this morning and I said, well, you know, what's it cost to get this stuff flown up there? Well, they had enough funds to have two flights. The first flight was 7,000 with all the stuff. The second one, the missionary pilot discharges them for the air miles. So, but yet they still have other stuff behind, like food and that kind of stuff, and they don't have any food unless they get it up by plane or the boat, which takes a couple of weeks, into the jungle. So we asked them, we said, well, how much, how much do you need? And he says, we need another $5,000. And so... Uh, I said, well, let me check with the elders and see what we might be able to do. Now, one thing, a blessing about this church, you guys give and you give abundantly, and we never have to ask you guys to give to the Lord's work. You give as the Lord puts it on your heart. You give cheerfully. And so we never have to come up here and say, look, hey, I need $5,000 a day. Can you guys write a check? You've been in churches like that. They tell you that. You know, can you, you know, if you, can you write checks today and bring, up, bring them up front or whatever? We don't have, we budget the funds in the church from what you give so that when different initiatives come up, we can go to the checking account. Praise God, the money's there, amen? amen. Because of your faithfulness and God's goodness. So he wrote back and he says, good news, good news, we only need $4,001 because someone just responded to the email we sent out and we're sending $999. So asked the elders, and we were all in agreement. So because of what you've done and your contributions, we were able to send those funds to them this morning. And, uh, amen. And, and, what, and what's beautiful is, is uh, you know, I'm, I'm on this technology. It's not working. And I, I emailed Mike. I said, we're trying to, like, do this with, you know, online, and it's not working. And he calls me up. I'm thinking, who in the world is this from Massachusetts? It turns out... It's amazing technology. Verizon, on the edge of the jungle, he's calling me right before he's getting into the jungle on a cell phone. And so he tells me that it'll work with PayPal. And so we were able to, to use PayPal and get it in. But what's really exciting is, and this guy's really on top of technology, and, and somehow Elon Musk is connected with communication into third world countries. And uh, it's amazing how the, the Lord uses this unbeliever to do a lot of amazing things. <clears throat> this is technology. He's going to be able to do a Zoom in the jungle, in the church. So we'll be able to see them up here in the jungle with the torches, with all the stuff. And they just want to thank you guys. So that's going to be coming up probably in a few weeks. So glory to God, right? So we we'll pray, for, pray for all that. And then the next thing we wanted to share was that Family Dollar is empty now. We talked to the landlord about the possibility of getting more space, which we could use because that kids' ministry is exploding. And so we wanted to, to get some of that space if we could. Now, the rent in that particular part of the, of the, of the real estate um, shopping center is like three times what we pay here. So we can't afford that. So we're trying to negotiate, pray that the landlord might give us favor. We ne might necessarily need all that space unless the Lord wants, wants us to have it. There's 7,500 square uh, foot more. But uh, it would be nice to get like 2,500 square feet if we could. So please pray about that too, okay? And um, so before I get into the teaching, I wanted to share a little bit from my heart. It, it's, it's beautiful how the Lord's working in here with, with you guys. The, the team teaching on Wednesday night, the different guys, the the women's studies, the women's teaching, Pastor Lewis taking a month and then I take a month. And it gives us time as pastors to hear from the Lord as well and to get refreshed and to reflect. 
because you can get so busy in life and ministry that you miss what God's doing because you're too busy. You're way ahead of him. It's easy to get, try to get ahead of God, isn't it? So when we were away, Cindy and I, on that vacation, I, I got an email from Calvary Philly that they were having a special night of reflection on what happened in the Jesus movement in the early 70s. So the, the man from Love Song, he's 80 years old now, and, and he's still playing music for the Lord, and he was used instrumentally to begin this new wave of contemporary Christian music. And it started with Calvary Chapel and, and the, the revival that occurred and uh, the thousands and thousands of hippies that got saved and 1,700 churches around the world now because of that one event. And we're praying as a church and as a movement and as a body of Christ that we need another outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so they gave testimonies of what happened during that time. And there was such an outpouring that there was no need to try to put pressure on people to get saved. People were just coming to Jesus. Amen. They were just coming to Jesus by, by the work of the Holy Spirit. It happened to me. It happened to Cindy. We didn't know anything about church. We didn't know anything about Jesus. We didn't know anything about getting saved. We were just lost. And God poured out his grace and favor upon us and opened our eyes and showed us who Jesus was and how much we needed him. And one woman, she gave her testimony. Her husband was a drug dealer. He was running around, girlfriends, and she had two babies, and her parents were saying, you can't be with this guy. He's going to ruin your life. So she eventually d divorced him. And the guy had taken so much LSD that his mind was not rational, and the doctor said he would have to be hospitalized his whole life. He could never live by himself. Well, he ended up meeting these people from Calvary, came to a service, came down front, got some people to lay hands on, pray for him. The Lord did a miracle and changed his mind and gave him a new mind. Healed, healed every issue of what he was dealing with because of LSD. So he went back home and he talked to his wife and he's, his ex-wife and he said, honey, I wanted to talk to you. And she's like looking at him, okay, what's he up to now, you know? And he says, do you know Jesus? And she says, well, I, th I know about him, but what do you mean do I know Jesus? He says, well, I met Jesus and he changed my life. And she's thinking, oh, boy, this is more overflow of his drug addictions and abuse. He said, honey, there's a concert down at the beach tonight. He knew she liked music. He said, why don't you get down? I'll watch the kids. So she went down. There was no concert. There was a big baptism of all these people getting baptized. <laughs> and one guy with a guitar playing, playing music. So she's getting caught up in the atmosphere, and she gets in line, and some hippie behind her says, are you saved? And she's, she says, no, I don't think so. And he says, do you know Jesus? She says, well, I know about him, but I don't, I don't, I know, I don't know who he is. He says, well, can I tell you about him? And she says, well, sure. So he tells her about him, and he prays with her, and she believes. And so she's in line with hundreds of people, and she gets down there. Lo and behold, there's Chuck Smith there in the water, one of the men that were baptizing. And he says, are you saved? And she says, yes. He says, how long? She says, I just got saved in a linebacker. <laughs> he said, that's good enough for me. And he, and he baptized her, you know. So when Joe and those guys, Joe's my age, 72, and here we are pastoring these churches as older guys now. And we can't make anything happen. We can't bring revival. We can't save anybody. We can't change anybody. But Jesus can. He's still changing lives, changing people, changing you, changing me. And so as I was sitting there and I was thinking, 
about us here. What do we what are we are what are we praying about? What are we praying for? What are we living for? What are we waiting for? If we're the Lord's, we're waiting for him to move by his Holy Spirit in relationships, families, and marriages, and kids, work, neighbors. That there might be this evidence of God doing something that we know we have nothing to do with. It's all him, right? So we're in Romans today, Romans chapter 8. And let's look at this together. Father, we're here today, Lord, to receive life again from you. Not information, but transformation. We want our hearts, Lord, to be refreshed today. We want our minds to be renewed, Lord. We don't want religion. We don't want sermons, Lord, that are just filled with whatever, Lord. We want the movement of your Holy Spirit in the church today. And we know you desire to do this all over the earth. And so, Lord, we just lay our hearts before you this morning. May we hear what it is that the Spirit is saying to the church. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Can someone turn those fans on back there, please? If I'm going to switch on the wall, thanks. Yeah, turn the lights off. They want to go to sleep. <laughs> uh, that's it. They're starting to move. We don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us in groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So here we all are today. Ted was praying in the hallway before we came in here today to, to have the service. People are coming in here today with all kinds of different issues in their lives, burdens on their hearts, questions in their minds, challenges in their lives, uh, fears, worries, anxieties, health issues, financial issues, you, you name it. And there's no way that I can fix or help with any of that stuff this morning apart from the work of God's Holy Spirit working through the message. So have you ever been in a situation, and I know some of you have recently, you're so broken and so overwhelmed and so out of it because of what has occurred in your life, and I've been there and many of us have been there in times of tragedy and adversity and difficulty, that I, first of all, I don't know what to pray for. I don't know how to pray. And maybe I don't even want to pray. You ever get in that place? It doesn't matter because guess what? It tells us in the scriptures, the Holy Spirit knows how to pray. And he's praying for you. He's interceding before God. All your groanings, all your cryings, all your screaming out to God, whatever. He, he takes that. Burden, and he, he ministers on behalf of your brokenness and your struggle and your challenge, and he brings it to the throne of the Father to be ministered to and by and for you and me. And not only is he praying, but Jesus is our intercessor. It says that we might be able to come to him at any time and find mercy and help in our time of need. That we can come boldly into the throne room of grace. That we might find mercy and grace and help in our time of need. 
Because we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities, infirmities or weaknesses, and overwhelming situations and circumstances in our lives. We don't have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus knows exactly what you're feeling, what you're thinking, what you're going through, and he's petitioning the Father on your behalf as well. What do we have to worry about? Why do we worry? Why are we so negative? Why are we so concerned about what's going on in the world that it, it's taken our joy away, robbing our, our peace, taking our minds to places of darkness and hopelessness? It tells us in Philippians to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, we're to let our requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes human understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Not on CNN, not Fox, not Sean Hannity who's making $35 million a year getting you all amped up emotionally. And I'm serious. That guy cannot relate to my financial situation. He got it made. Even if you turn him off, there's millions of other people that are listening to the same stuff about Biden, about woke, about, you know, the college campuses, about Palestinian terrorists. And it goes on and on, and I'm not going to stop. As it was in the days of Noah, Cindy and I were talking about this the other day, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns. Guess when the days of Noah started? Back in Genesis. You think things are bad now. Try living before the flood when God this ha had it. I'm, I'm wiping everything out, everybody out. I'm starting all over again. If you then be risen with Christ, it says in Colossians, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the Father. For your life is hid with Christ in God. We should be the most optimistic, most positive, most joyful people on the face of the planet. And we're all walking around with you know, somber looks. Or people are texting me videos of other pastors. Get your people rapture ready. Give them this uh, thing to stick in their computer so that whenever we're gone, they'll know what to do. That is old news. Salem Kerban in the early uh, mid earlys wrote a book, God to Survival. And this is to be left on your coffee table so when we were raptured, people would know what to do. Well, Salem's gone. It's 50 years I'm getting older. Jesus still hasn't come back, but he's already back in my heart now. What, what, what else am I waiting for? In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the Bible says. And we have all that we need in, in Jesus Christ. Amen. And what a privilege it is to live in a day like today that we can make an impact on the world. Grace FM, the radio station, the teaching that goes out, the lives that are touched, uh, the, the ministries all over the face of the earth that are being used by the Lord to prepare people for the kingdom that is yet to come. But more importantly, mobilizing the body of Christ to get lost people into the kingdom. So he makes intercession according to the will of God for you and me, the saints. Uh, chapter 8 of Romans, all the commentators that know the Bible really well say this is the most powerful chapter in the whole Bible. It covers everything you need in your life to experience fullness and reality and overcoming victorious living. Overcoming victorious living. And we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, these all things, sometimes we personalize it. Well, my things. No, it's all things. It's all things of creation, all things of the universe, all things that God has in store and plan. Everything is working together for the ultimate good of us and for his glory. They're working together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew. Now, God knew you before you were born. Paul got saved. He didn't pray any sinner's prayer. He just got knocked down on his face on the road 
down going toward Damascus and he, and he all of a sudden realized that he had encountered Jesus Christ. And even if he didn't want to believe, he couldn't help to believe because God made him believe and changed his whole life and called him to be an apostle. You got to be kidding me, right? So he said he knew Paul in his mother's womb. He knew Paul was going to rebel. He knew Paul was going to persecute Christians. He knew Paul was going to be a real pain in the butt to the church in the New Testament. He also knew Paul was going to be a man that served him and loved him and lived for him. So every one of you in here today and everybody on the face of the earth, God knows. He knows you by name. How many names can you guys keep in your mind at one time? Like, I see all you, and you're leaving here. I'm thinking, what's their name? You know, what's your name? I feel, you know, I'm older, right? My, I don't remember as well as I used to. So if I ask your name 10 times, give me grace and, and tell me it again. And when I really get to know you, because you share something deep or personal with you, and I pray with you, that's when I usually really get to know names. But the, how, how great is our God? He knows every name of every person who's ever been created. When, when you call out to him in prayer, he's like, who are you? Can you identify yourself? Can you see my secretary at the front door there and, and, and sign these forms and tell me who you are and why you want to see me? He already knows who we are. He knows why we want to see him, why we want to talk to him. He foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So Jesus represents the new Adam. When, they, and when creation occurred and Adam fell and the whole human race got messed up and we're all sinful people, when Jesus showed up on the scene, he showed humanity that this is what God had in mind in the beginning. This is the kind of man that I created to live this way, to be this kind of person. So when we see Jesus, this is the perfect example of what it is that God created you and me to be. And he gives us a chance to become like that through our salvation, our new birth, Amen. getting saved, getting born again. We, we begin to slowly begin to become more like Jesus, right? A little bit more every day. He, he doesn't wipe your personality out or your looks or your appearance or your, you know, how you are, your, your, your ways about you, your uniqueness. He, he keeps all that intact. But he, he does this work in the heart. And when he starts working in the heart, he begins to conform you to the image and likeness of God. And so whenever you and I are out and about, people should be able to look at us and say, there's something different about them. They're not like normal people I, I run into. There's something about them, and you know, we're not perfect, but there's something about them that is unique. They have a joy about them. They have a graciousness about them. They have a, a love, a peace, a gentleness about them. And that's the, that's the character of Jesus Christ. I was talking to Cindy the last couple of days about some things that the Lord's speaking to me about. Married 53 years now, I think, this summer. And boy, I've given that woman a rough ride. <laughs> I have not been easy to live with. And I was telling her this morning about some things I was sorry for in the past. And she says, honey, that's okay. We're all on a journey. We are. Things aren't real clear at different times and stages of our lives as they, we would like them to be or maybe they need to be. We're not ready to see things about ourselves at certain times because we think we're better than we really are. And the Lord isn't a put-down kind of God. He's a God that builds us up because he wants us to forget the things that are behind and press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But there's an issue in the heart, in your heart today, in my heart today, that God wants to address Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of life. Not out of the mind, but out of the heart. 
It's with the heart man believes. And with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. And try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When we got marriage counseling many, many years ago, and we got marriage counseling several times in our life. I'm the type of guy, I need married counseling every day <laughs> in order to make life easier for Cindy. And thank God for him being the counselor because he does counsel me. But I think of the things that you can't see until you have a conversation with someone that sees things deeper than, than you can. That's why we're, we're called to be iron sharpening iron. We don't, we're not like looking at each other. Well, what can I criticize this person about? Or what can I straighten this person out about? That's not the way the spirit of God works. How can I be used by God to be a blessing in your life and you to be a blessing in my life to help me grow and become more like Jesus? So this, this issue of the heart, keeping it with all diligence... Like everything that's meaningful and anything that's supernatural and anything that's Christ-centered, if Christ has your heart and my heart, he's going to flow out of your heart to someone else's heart with what it is he has and wants to give to the other person. And what happens to most of our hearts, we put a fortress around our heart because we've been hurt. And getting hurt is no fun. It's painful. So the way our minds work, the way we think we can handle things, well, I'm just going to be protecting myself. I'm not going to be vulnerable. It's another word for being hard-hearted. If you're hard-hearted, what do you care what anybody says or thinks? You're just going to let it fall to the ground. But Jesus, his heart was always open and vulnerable. And that's the way we're to be too. And it's like a miracle. Whenever God begins to get a hold of our heart, he has our life. He has everything. What can you give to the Lord today, this morning? Give me your heart, he says. Are you willing to give him your heart? Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? This is areas in your Bible I challenge you and encourage you to underline, highlight, memorize. When you're out and about in life, in your corporate world, you're in your married life, in your neighborhood, and wherever you are, if God is for you, who can be against you? You have the greatest one in the universe that's standing on your behalf and defending you. And protecting you. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God the Father gave us his son so that we might have everything we need. He, he allowed him to be sacrificed and to be crucified and to be falsely accused so that we wouldn't ever have to be before his throne of grace. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? That's God's kids, God's people. It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. As I said earlier, he is praying on our behalf. Jesus said he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Question mark. Should any of those things separate us from the love of God? Paul talks about what they're dealing with as apostles and Christians and early martyrs in the early church. For your sake, we're killed all day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. So here's Paul. He's in prison. He's being beaten. He's in stocks. He's, you know, the other guys are beginning to get hassled and persecuted. Uh, eventually, they all got martyred except for the apostle John. And that was just the tip of the iceberg of what happened after the beginning of Christianity. If you read Fox's book of martyrs, the number of countless millions of Christians who have been martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ is just over, overwhelming. And to this day, it continues. And yet he can say that in all these things, they are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I want that kind of faith, don't you? I'm, I'm uh, defeated if there's a traffic jam. I'm defeated if things don't go my way. I'm depressed if I don't think I'm getting what I think I'm entitled to. All this self-centeredness, isn't it like what messes us up? Instead of being thankful, Cindy said, the other day, she said, you know, we need to be grateful every moment of our life. Grateful. Because we don't know how much more time we have. And we have so much to be grateful for, don't we? So much to be thankful for. I'm persuaded, Paul says, that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, that's abundant life. That's joyful living. Please do not text me negative things anymore. I love you guys, but I don't need bad news. I want good news. You want to text me something? Text me what this says, what the Word of God says. Not what some so-called prophet has to say or what someone thinks they have a special connection and voice of God that I need to give you an update because I got secret information that no one else knows about and I want to tell you, I don't, need, I don't have time for that stuff. I got everything I need in the Word of God. Amen. And you do too. We need to be building each other up in the truths of the Word of God because our minds are fragile and they're so easily um, influenced by data and information that comes our way through YouTube and through uh, social media and through newscasts. You know, I, I, like, I like watching Fox News because I am a conservative, okay? I'm, I proudly say I'm conservative have conservative biblical views. That doesn't mean I support every um, ideology that some, comes out of some conservative mouth. But So we, we watch the, the five, and it's, if you want to get a quick overview of life in an hour, you get it from them, and it's sort of humorous. They have four Republicans and one Democrat on there. So um, it's sort of outweighed, but nonetheless, they, that's how they do it. But if you watch Laura Ingram and you watch uh, Jesse Waters and you watch Sean Hannity, they're all saying the same thing for three hours. <laughs> and they've got the same people on, on air that they're getting paid to be a, a contributor or whatever. And, you know, it didn't take me too long after a while, you know, because I just wanted some brain drain and I'd be better off watching the Three Stooges or something, you know, but uh, they have some comedy but I, I, you know, sort of watched that stuff for a while, and I said to Cindy, like, do we have to have this on? And she says, no, and then we turn it off, you know. The baby speaking in tongues back there. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit takes the groanings and utterances, and the baby probably has more wisdom than all of us in here today, right? 
So pre please continually pray for Pastor Lewis and myself, the men who teach Wednesday, the women, everybody's teaching the Word, that we keep the main thing, the main thing, the Word of God. That we are victorious in our living before Christ because of what Christ has done for us. Honor him, glorify him, bless him, love him, honor him, live for him. Think about your wife and your husband. Build them up in the word of God. Pray together as families. Think on things that are pure and lovely and just and a good report. Pray for the city of Greensburg in the United States of America for an outpouring of God's spirit and the gospel so people can come into the kingdom. That's how culture changes through lives that are changed by Jesus Christ. Pray for the 1040 window, the 3.5 billion people that are yet to hear the gospel. Pray for the missionaries, Philemon, and he's in the, the uh, deserts of uh, Pakistan near Afghanistan now. Pray for him as a witness out there. Pray for the Dawsons as they take this information and these tools up into the jungles in the next uh, month or so. Pray for your place of employment. You might not like your job, Sometimes I don't. But if I begin to think about the people I work with and ways that I might want to tell them about Jesus, it begins to be a fun job. One of my coworkers lost his dad recently, unexpectedly. This guy had reactions to COVID shot. He's been sick since he's had it. He's a wonderful salesperson, very positive thinker doesn't know Jesus yet, but he knows my heart. And I get a chance to talk to him about that kind of stuff, this kind of stuff, and a different level of communication. But every one of you are missionaries. You have someone you care about that you want to know Jesus. Invite him to church. Invite him to listen to Grace FM. Simple ways of reaching out. Tell them what Jesus did for you. Yep. Ask God to birth in you the desire and the, and the, and the uh, heart to want to share your faith. You can't do this in your own strength. It's got to be through the Spirit of God. And ask the Lord to do for you what you can't do for yourself. This uh, fortress that is around our hearts today. The Lord wants to take the bricks and the walls down so that there's nothing in between you and God. So this morning, I'd like to have a special time of prayer for people just to come forward privately, just you and the Lord as the worship team comes forward. And, and bring whatever is on your heart before the Lord here publicly. I think it's healthy to do that once in a while. Or you might be hurting or you know someone else who's hurting and you want to pray for them. Let's give the Holy Spirit some time to, to minister to us. Marriages, kids, work, health. You know, I don't know what, what the needs are, but Jesus does. And let the Lord uh, build a bridge between your heart and him. If there's a chasm there maybe right now because you've allowed life to take away from you life and joy and meaning. In the supper, you just take that as you're led today as you deal with your own hearts before the Lord. I'm not going to lead you in that. just want to 
end the service in prayer. So uh, let's, let's come up and pray. I'm going to be up here praying myself. If you guys want to join me, come on up, and the worship team can lead us for a while in prayer. And, and um, let's see what God might do, right? Taking stuff out of our hearts, right?